And there are things in relationship to this fear that you and I have to recognize. That if you trust in God and let Him be your guide and strength, you won't have that fear. And your fear is in relationship to your trust. As your faith in God gets stronger, your fear dissipates. And as your faith in God gets weaker, your fear arises. You want to have fear dissipated and removed? Then you rise up and hold up the name of the living God and look to Him to undertake for you, and He will. It's our faith that brings victory. It's our faith that casts out fear and enables us to put our trust in the blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We will worship the man of Galilee who went to a cross 2,000 years ago. And no one can take his place. No one will intercede or interfere. We will not permit it. And so it is we have faith without fear. Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Doug Wicks, and I'm uh, an elder here at church, uh, at Beach Bible Church. And, uh, you know, I think I, I only preach maybe once a year, maybe once every year and a half. It's been at least a year and a half now. And I think the last time I preached, there was actually, uh, I think there are more people in the room than last time I preached. So um, I guess if you count those people out there, uh, it's great to have the, the folks out in the, uh, in the uh, courtyard and also you at home or wherever you are, uh, welcome here this morning. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was just talking to uh, my son last night, who had a, uh, who got a uh, a new job, and uh, they told him that he needs to uh, he needs to be smiling when he talks. And I find that to be so difficult to do. And so I, um, uh, I. I I'm smiling now, <laughs> and uh, I just I hope that um, uh, just the the seriousness of this of this message of uh, as we talk about fear um, hits our hearts, and I don't want this to be um, taken frivolously. Um, this is a uh, uh, this is a big deal, you know. In Scripture, uh, the most common command is "Do not fear." Don't be afraid. Jesus said it often. Uh, I was, as I was reflecting on that, on that command, I realized that, uh, you know, it depends who's saying that to you that determines whether or not you want to hear it. So if someone who is basically got no power and says, oh, don't be afraid, I think, like, What? you don't have any authority to say that I shouldn't be afraid. And yet, you know, if an angel says, don't be afraid, or Jesus says, don't be afraid, or your father, your young son or, or a child, and your father says, don't be afraid, that's a big deal. You trust that. So we've been uh, addressing having uh, faith in the face of fear, and this morning we're going to look at, um, at Esther and how she handled uh, fear. We've looked uh, up to this point in the book of Esther, um, which is just 10 chapters, and uh, we've looked at uh, how the Jews who were exiled for now 100 years in, in the book of Esther roughly, and, um, you know, 70 years was under captivity uh, with the Babylonians, and then uh, they were allowed to go back to Israel, but they, some of them stayed behind, and then uh, uh, Persia took over uh, Babylon, or took over the uh, uh, rule, and so now they here, these, uh, these Jews are in in Persia, and they are still in exile. They are still foreigners in this land. And um, as we study this book, you know, and we're reminded once again that um, uh, 
that God, the, the word God is not mentioned in the book of Esther. But you cannot not see God in the book of Esther. Uh, it's like the wind. You can't see the wind, but you know the wind is there because you know how it is affecting people and how it's affecting those things that, the, that, uh, that it comes in contact with. Uh, but what a great study we've we've been so far. Um, we've been in so far. I've I've loved digging into this book and and understanding it more deeply. Um, but you know, there's a lot of questionable behavior by the Jews in this. Uh, well, and also by the Persians in this uh, in this book. Um, but it shows that in spite of 100 years of exile um, and Israel's really a lot of moral compromise. God has not abandoned his promises. God is faithful to what he said he would do. And we see that in this book, and especially at this point where we are now. Let me just give a little bit of a review. Um, and one thing we don't know as we look through this narrative, we don't know the, if, if, if what God thinks about these things that are being done in this book we don't know what he thinks about um, when, uh, when King Ahasuerus or King uh, Xerxes, I'm going to call him Xerxes because it's easier for me to say, uh, King Xerxes, when he decides he's not going to, he, he doesn't want to have Queen Vash Vashti anymore uh, because she has disobeyed him. He did not follow, she did not follow his commands. Um, so he banishes his queen, and he needs to have a new queen now, and so he decides he's going to have basically a beauty pageant. And uh, Esther, who is Jewish, uh, becomes queen because she's beautiful. And the, queen, and the king really likes Esther. Ah, but the king's right-hand man does not like the Jews. Uh, and we see that in his, uh, he's introduced in chapter 3, and, and Nick, uh, youth pastor here, Nick uh, talked about uh, Haman and how he brought uh, this decree to the king for him to put into place that would annihilate the Jews, all because of Haman's hatred of one man, who is a Jew. His name is Mordecai. So Haman convinces the king to have an edict to annihilate the Jews. So Mordecai sees there's really only one way to save the Jews, and that's through Queen Esther. Because Queen Esther has access to the king. So today, we are going to look at what drove Queen Esther's fear and how she responded to that. You know, what is fear? Fear is uh, an unpleasant emotion. People don't usually like to have fear. And it's an unpleasant emotion when something that we highly value is at risk whatever that is, something that we don't want to lose, whether it's our life, our family, our health, our wealth, our home, thinking of people who are struggling with fires right now. Fear rises up, and it's an emotion of uh, being uh, concerned, deeply concerned about something that's real, something that is imminent in our minds that could happen, that could be taken away from us. So today we're going to look at, um, at how fear affected Esther and how with Mordecai's guidance, Esther overcomes her fear. And she follows through with a carefully crafted plan and doing what she knows is right 
for her, for her family, for her people. But fully realizing this could come at an ultimate cost. She knows that. So as we dig into the, to the passages uh, today, and we're going to be looking at, at s- several chapters because there's a lot going on, and I'll, I'm going to get into that in just a moment. Um, but uh, let's pray and ask God to um, speak to us and maybe reveal our own fear that we're going through right now. Let's pray. Father, you are faithful. Thank you for your word. Thank you for um, this book of Esther. Thank you that we can see you and your hand in it. And thank you that you love us and you tell us not to be afraid. And we can take comfort in that because you have authority and power. And we trust you. So speak to us through your word this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a so Esther is a narrative, and uh, with a narrative in in scripture, especially Old Testament narrative, you you really, it's hard to tell what to get from it. Um, Oftentimes we just need to stand back and look and see what God is doing. And that's enough in a narrative. But this morning I'm going to, we're going to dig in and I'm at risk, I'll tell you that, I'm at risk of, of pulling something out of this that is prescriptive for us to do because it doesn't say this is what you're supposed to do. This is just basically says what was done. And there's some bad things, very clearly bad things that are done in this book. And so we need to separate the good things from the bad and try to glean the good things and try to uh, remove the bad things. So um, I'm just going to give you uh, hopefully um, uh, the thesis of what I'm going to say today is that in the face of fear, or a problem, whatever you're facing. We need to get wise counsel who will clarify our convictions so that we can craft a plan and then carry out that plan. That's exactly what happened in the book of Esther. Get wise counsel, clarify your convictions, craft a plan, and then carry out that plan. So... As stories go, narrative is is a story. Um, As stories go, uh, there's a certain structure to a story or certain components to a story that are in every story, almost every story. Um, And there's an author that I appreciate. His name is Donald Miller, um, who has studied story and how to use story uh, to be influential in marketing and, and things like that. Uh, he's a great storyteller. Um, and he says that there are seven components to a story. You have a character, which is normally the hero, who has a problem, who meets a guide, who then gives them a plan and calls them to action. And that action either ends in failure or it ends in success. So it's that simple. A character has a problem, meets a guide, gives him a plan, who calls him to action, and that action either ends in failure or success. Now, we all have guides in our life. Lord willing, your father or your mother are a guide to you as, uh, if you're a child. I'm going to put up some, some quotes of some famous guides, maybe, maybe not famous. I want, first we're going to, so the quote is going to go up and you're going to have to uh, think in your minds and if you're here and you can tell me who you think uh, said this. So we'll start with the first one. Never put passion in front of principle because even if you win, you'll lose. 
Anybody know? That's from the Karate Kid. And that, that, that guide is Miyagi, the classic, the classic uh, old school guide. Who, uh, and remember the character's name is Daniel, I think. Um, okay, next, next one. Another guide. Quote, the wise only speak of what they know. Any ideas? So that's Gandalf. Another very wise guide in, uh, to, to Bilbo in, uh, in The Hobbit. Um, okay, the next one. There's always something more to learn, even for a master. This, this is a tough one, I think. We were just discussing this this morning. This, was, this movie came out 12 years ago. Yeah, this is Master Ugwe from Kung Fu Panda. Did you get that? Nice. Master Ugwe. And then the, the classic, uh, fear is the path that leads to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. And hate leads to suffering. There's a clue in that quote. Okay, yeah, this is Yoda. I think Yoda, other than Mordecai, is the classic guide, right? But we all need a guide in our life, someone who comes alongside us, who clarifies what we want, what we want to do, what we need to do, and then walks with us as we do it. Now, did you ever think about who, who was Jesus' guide? I think the Father and the Holy Spirit were Jesus' guide. Jesus often went away by himself to spend time with the Father. He often quoted the Father on what he was charged to do, made it very specific. So even Jesus has a guide. So in this story of Esther, Mordecai's problem, which is his people, the Jews, are going to be annihilated. And there's a date set in the future that was set by chance, by rolling of the dice or um, lots of some determining what the date was going to be. So it was set in the future. And on this day, the Jews were going to be annihilated, all because of Haman the king's right-hand man, his hatred for Mordecai and for the Jewish people. So Mordecai's problem, he sees a solution. He sees a solution in Esther. And so Esther, he sees that Esther has been positioned to solve this problem, to be the hero. And Mike talked about that last week, about that setup. And now Esther has an opportunity to do good. So in this story, um, along this this idea of, you know, we've got this problem and we've got a guide. Every character in in this story so far has a guide, except for Mordecai. Mordecai is the guide. The king, he has a guide. It's Haman. What a horrible guide. This is a guy, guide who is selfish. His, his desires are not for the good, a greater good. They're for himself. He only wants to raise up himself. The king, unfortunately, doesn't know that because he's too him to himself, I think. That should give us a clue. So the king has a guide. Haman has a guide. Who's Haman's guide? It's himself. Nobody speaks to Haman. Nobody gives Haman advice. I'm not even sure the king would give could give Haman advice. I think Haman is just a narcissist. And narcissists get advice from no one. Narcissists give their own advice. And they expect their advice to be heard. 
But Esther has a guide, Mordecai. He is a God-fearing man. That's very clear. And he has the greater good in mind to save his people. And Mordecai is relentlessly faithful. We'll see a bit of that. So Esther's first response to when Mordecai gives guidance to Esther is fear. Let's look. Um, you know, there, there's a passage I want to look at before we look at Esther. It's in Psalm uh, 56, and I don't think there's a slide for this. It says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. This is Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. When I am afraid, I will trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? What a great passage. And I think Esther is at this place to believe this. But when she first encounters Mordecai's request. So Mordecai, they never actually see each other face to face. Mordecai's at the gate, Esther's inside the, the palace, and they've got this person running back giving messages to each other. And so let's just, I, I, and this is all set up for, for Esther's response, okay? Esther's first response is here, and, and Mike, Mike uh, touched on this last week, and this is just as a review. Uh, Esther 4, chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. I'm going to start with 9. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, uh, the king has but one law, and that is he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to be with the king. So here's a king who has a queen. They don't have a very equal relationship. The, queen, the king decides when the queen is going to, to, uh, to grace his presence. So Esther's first response. So you realize, th thinking back to what, uh, if I were to give a quote of, 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 of a guide, and uh, I probably should have put this up there, the, the quote from Mordecai. The quote from Mordecai is, who knows if you haven't put into this, been put into this royal position for such a time as this to save your people? That is a famous quote in Scripture. When, when you see that, you think, ah, that's Mordecai to Esther. So, but Mordecai just says, you know, you need to go before the king because you're gonna, you need to save your people. And her response is, one excuse after another. The first excuse is, I can't approach the king without being summoned. I shall be put to death. Well, perhaps. Doesn't happen every time, because sometimes he extends the scepter, right? So that's excuse number one. I can't approach the king without being summoned. Fear excuse number two. He won't extend the gold scepter to me. He's not, he doesn't like me enough to extend the gold scepter to me. I'm not in favor with him enough. Which also is related to fear, excuse number three. I'm not even sure he likes me anymore. 30 days, he hasn't called for me. I'm not even sure I'm, I'm really in his favor. Doubt, doubt, doubt. So the first fear, I can't approach the king, I shall be put to death, perhaps. Fear excuse number two, you won't extend the gold scepter to me, perhaps. I'm not even sure he likes me right now, true, but perhaps that's not even an issue. 
you realize how when you're fearful, you start making up things, right? And they're obviously, they're contingency that are to the negative, because that's what fear does. And then Mordecai responds, Esther 4, 16 and 17. Sorry. That's when Mordecai, Mordecai gives his response that, you know, maybe you've put, been put in this place to, to save the people. Maybe you've been put in your royal uh, position for such a time as this. And uh, Esther responds. Verses 16 and 17, chapter 4. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. She's made a change. She's making a plan. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. This is a complete fast. This is not just a daytime fast. I and my maids will fast as you do, and when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She has faced her fear. We see in, uh, in Mordecai's um, appeal to convictions that uh, we realize that uh, the promises and the commands of God are at issue here, is what needs to be trusted. And we also learn that Esther has a strong love for her people. And she also realizes it's the right thing to do. So she crafts a plan. What does she do? First thing, she involves others. This is so important. The very people she is committed to save, she involves them. She says, fast for me. So Mordecai is faithful. And he goes, he tells all the Jewish people to fast for three days. What this also does is shows she's now accountable. She can't back out of what she's going to do. When you commit your plans to somebody, that becomes accountability. If your plans are just in your own head, ah, if you do them, no big deal. So she involved others. She also encouraged them to pray, which really is what fasting is. Fasting is just intense, holistic prayer. And the fasting part allows you to focus on the prayer part. And she also is willing to make her move. She's willing to die. Her plan recognizes the potential cost. If I perish, I perish. And like I said, her guide is faithful. In verse 17, Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. He was faithful. Of course, he had uh, motivation, right? One thing that uh, when I first read this story, and I didn't real- realize this, is that, so what about the Jews in Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem was part of the provinces of, of the Persian Empire. So they would be killed in Jerusalem as well. Even those who have gone back would have been killed. So this is Esther's plan. Now she gets to carry out the plan. Sometimes this is the hardest part, but now she's accountable. People have been praying and fasting. Let's read, uh, and this is a, a bit longer passage, but I wanted to make sure I read the whole, the whole text. Um, Esther, verse, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out 
to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. I can imagine Esther's heart absolutely racing at this point. Then the king asked, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king again asked Esther, Now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom it will be granted. And Esther replied, My petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet. I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Oh, my goodness. What in the world is Esther doing? When I read that, I think, what? She's got his attention. The scepter is out. This is the second time. Well, let's go through what uh, what might might have been uh, what happened and, and what it might have been going through Esther's mind, and a lot of this is speculation, because, and and I will I will try to be as as explicit as I can in what is explicit and also explicit with what is implied or not even implied, maybe uh, conjectured or um, or surmised. So verse 1, she dresses for the occasion. What does that mean? She's no longer fasting. When you're fasting, you're not dressed in royal garb. You don't, you don't fast in, uh, in royal clothing. So she has dressed, but she's also dressed for the king because she wants to honor him. I think she probably, you know, from my perspective, she wants to eliminate any possibility of setting him off in the wrong direction, right? So she honors her, the king with what she wears. And I think, you know, if you did a study with, uh, in Scripture of what we wear and how that matters, it matters. I think in our culture we don't, uh, uh, we don't hide that to, uh, hold that to high regard, um, in high regard. But she held it in high regard. I think she's trying to remove obstacles to a yes to her request. The good news, the king responds immediately favorably. Her, his first response is to hold out the scepter, and she comes. He was pleased with her, it says. And she says, up to half my kingdom. Now, this is probably hyperbole. This is not, he's not really offering up to half his kingdom He's probably just saying, you know what, you know, be liberal with your request. But she decides to let it build by deferring to later that day because she's prepared a banquet. But she also invites Haman. Why is that? This guy that, that hates her cousin Mordecai and hates her people, she's invited Haman. I think this is, you know, this is all conjecture here. I think this is a really strategic move because if she goes away and doesn't invite Haman, Haman could feel as though he's being slighted and he goes to the king now and starts talking trash, whatever it is, just putting in little things that might prevent so Esther says, you know what, just bring him on. I'm going to lavish him just like I'm lavishing the king with praise and with, with honor and with a banquet. All conjecture. So she wants to keep this positive vibe going. So she defers, then she defers to the next day. 
So the question is, is this a stall tactic? Is she, is she getting cold feet? Um, man, I don't know. I don't think so. There's nothing in the text that says that she was fearful at this point. Um, but we do know that God moved in the time, from the time that she said goodbye to them this day, after the banquet that first night, to the next night, some really important things happened. And important things that teed up what was going to happen the next day when she gives the reveal that it's Haman that is going to annihilate her people, and, and her included. So what happens that, in, in, and that's what happens in chapter 6, and we're not going to, I told you I'm talking about Esther. Uh, Mike is going to address uh, what happens with, uh, uh, with Haman's hatred at this point and how that uh, um, has, ends up in his demise. Um, but what happens when that night is that Haman, immediately when he leaves, he has another encounter with Mordecai. And Mordecai, once again, does not honor Haman. And this infuriates Haman. So he's even more intensely upset. And that's when he decides he wants to build a, uh, a gallows, or a, a, I think the, the word means tree. Um, I don't know, we don't know if he's, you know, how he... How, how the execution happens, but he builds uh, a device for execution, and it's, it's designed for Mordecai. So the hatred has built at that point. But also that night, the king can't sleep. And in the middle of the night, and uh, he, he asks for the, the annals to be read, and, and uh, he, he decides that he wants to honor Mordecai. So... The Jews are being lifted up in the king's mind, and in Haman's mind, they're being lowered. And this is all teeing up for the next day. Day two. And this is when we come to, to chapter seven. And we're going to read this whole section as well. Chapter seven, verses one through eight. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. And as they were drinking wine on that second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, O king, and if it pleases your majesty, grant me my life. This is my petition. Grant me my life. He doesn't even know that her life is in danger. No clue. Grant me my life, this is my petition, and spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is this man who has dared to do such a thing? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is the vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. So the fear has now switched. The king got up in a rage, left his wine and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. And the king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? And as soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Wow, this is a pretty powerful scene, and this is, this is the Joseph revealing to his brothers who he is moment of this story. It's all laid bare now, and the character of each person is laid bare. 
Esther makes a really strong case, I think. But she also minimizes her position as queen. She is really deferential to him in this, in this request. She says, if it pleases the king. And in her request, she repeats re, uh, exactly what Haman had written in the king's decree. And that's from chapter 3, verse 13. It says, my people have been sold for, and here's the quote, destruction and slaughter and annihilation. Wow, that's powerful. My people, that includes me, have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. And she even is deferential, saying, you know, it would have been better if we'd just been put into slavery. And if we'd been put into slavery, there would have been no reason for me to come to you. Esther has faced her fear. She faces it by getting good guidance from a godly man. She realizes what her convictions are and their godly convictions. She makes a plan and she carries it out. So, what are some takeaways that we have of this, applying it, you know, directly to us? I think uh, I've got five. The first one is we don't want to lose touch with the people. Esther had lost touch with the people. She needed Mordecai to come to her and say, tell her what was happening. She didn't even know what was happening. So Esther got in touch with her people, and it was that that prompted, began to prompt her of what she needed to do. I was uh, reading just the last uh, couple of weeks about uh, Cameron Diaz, who's an actress uh, who does not act anymore. She completely got out of it, and she's just raising a family now. I wasn't really a Cameron Diaz fan, but um, what she said about being an actor and being in a bubble really, um, it struck me. This is what she said. When you're making a movie, it's a perfect excuse. They own you. Now think of Esther in this. They own you. You're there for 12 hours a day, for months on end, and you have no time for anything else. She said, actors are infantilized. We're put in a position where everything is taken care of for us. I told that story when we were having lunch on our vacation with, with, with a friend, and he looked at me and he said, I was that way. He was a leader of a, of a big uh, um, healthcare organization. He had all his plans organized for him. He had limos come pick him up. He flew first class. Uh, he was just taken care of. And he told the story one day of him uh, when his limo wasn't there when he landed in New York City and he got upset. And then he realized, he looked inward and thought, man, what have I become? How can I get upset over this? This is crazy. I think that when we live in little bubble, and I think we can live, especially in this, you know, in this COVID-19 uh, framework, we can really live in a bubble and we can expect things to be a certain way. And when they're not, we can get upset. Our world needs to become a little bit bigger. We can't lose touch with people. So that's the first one. The second takeaway is we have to have strong convictions. And that includes eternal things. God's promises. God's word. 
Too often our strongest convictions are the convictions that are self-serving convictions. The convictions that are, uh, you know, I need my space, uh, I need this routine in the morning, I need, I need, I need, I need, and it's all related to us. Our convictions are not related to other people. So we need to have strong convictions, strong godly convictions. Number three, we know that nearly every one of our decisions affects other people. Almost always. We often forget that. I think that's the first thing that we need to ask when we're making a big decision. How is this decision going to affect other people? And then we need to act out of love. So we need to seek good advice. And sometimes good advice is to helping us form our convictions. A good guide you will need. That was a smile, by the way. That was Yoda, by the way. So we need to seek good advice. We're really not good at seeking good advice. I'm, I'm, I've learned in my, uh, as I've grown older that I don't do a very good job of seeking for advice, and other people around me very seldom come to me and say, hey, you know, I'd, just like, I'd like your advice. But that's a very honoring thing to do. Not only to ask, you're honoring someone, but you feel honored when someone comes and said, hey, I'd, I'd like your advice. Mordecai gave good advice to Esther. And finally, we need to listen to advice. Esther would have been nothing if she would not have followed through on the advice that Mordecai gave. She had to. But she, maybe she didn't. Maybe she just goes back into her bubble. King never knows that she's Jewish unless Haman tells him. Could have happened. So don't lose touch. Have strong convictions. Know that every one of your decisions could affect other people. See good advice and actually listen to that advice. Um, I'm going to tell a quick story and then we'll close. It's, a, it's just a story of what happened when I... Uh, was challenged to take some advice from an unlikely um, person. We were in Uganda. Uh, most of you know that I'm, uh, my family was living in, in Uganda and serving the Bible translation work there. And we had built a house in the village, and it was in the year 2000. It was in the spring. It was about in March. So uh, Phoebe would have been three months old at this time. Um, and... Uh, we thought that we were going to be there for 20 or 30 years. Uh, I had a friend come to me, and he said, Doug, who, who's going to finish this work? So if that's, a, if that's a quote from a guide like that we just looked at, that's, that's the quote that guided me. That was the one that got me going. Who is going to finish this work? And my answer was, it's not going to be me. It's going to be these... Uh, these uh, men and women who live here in this language group are going to finish this work. That was my answer to him. And he said, then what in the world are you doing spending your time learning the language, focusing on yourself so you can do the work? You should be digging in and investing in these people. Speak English to them. That's what they, they already know the language. Help them with their linguistics and with their translation skills and their uh, understanding of their own grammar and etc. And that's exactly what we did. And we began to realize that it was not about us. It was about these people. And I gave up what was really, uh, it was a dream, you know, to, to live there because I was, but now I had a new dream. I had a new dream that these people would be empowered, resourced to do the work. And they've, they've done it. And there's great joy in that. Um, but it wouldn't have happened without a guide for me. And a guide who, who, who reminded me of my convictions and helped me with a plan forward. Um, so God's power 
is, re is revealed when we take small but significant steps of faith. And these the steps of faith are trust in his promises. And you remember, we remember that his promise to Israel that he was faithful to and to Esther and to Mordecai brought us Jesus. Because he was faithful through Esther's faithfulness, the Messiah came. And now we can be saved. Let's pray. Father, help us to face our fears. Help us to understand who you are and what you promise and that we can rest in that. We do not need to be afraid. Thank you for Esther. Thank you for her faithfulness. Help us to carry out the plan that you've put in our heads now to do the work that we need to do that is greater than us. And may it be for your glory and the glory of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.